Voice of America. Hi, I'm James Barty, Washington. Today is Friday, April 14. And here are some of the stories we are covering. Sudan's military and the rapid support forces deploy in Khartoum and other cities amid rising tensions. The country is passing a historic and dangerous curve, and the risk increases with the rapid support forces by mobilizing forces and spreading up inside the capital, Khartoum. Some Sudanese nationals in South Sudan want their leaders back home to choose peace rather than war. Cameroonian villagers say elephants devastate farmlands and plead for help. Botswana is on alert after the shooting of rhinos in their sanctuary. The news about more rhinos being poached in Botswana is very distressing. The International Rhino Foundation will continue to work to put a stop to poaching. And we will tell you why a Ghanaian activist is swimming the nearly 500-kilometer-long Volta River. Those stories plus something O'Malley sports are coming up on Daybreak Africa. Sudanese in the capital Khartoum and other cities across the country woke up on Thursday to a dramatic escalation in tensions between Sudan's armed forces and the paramilitary rapid support forces. On a televised report, Army spokesperson Brigadier Nabil Abdallah said recent RSF deployments in Khartoum and other cities have stirred up panic and fear among people. For VOA's South Sudan in Focus program, Nabil Biajo has the report. Army spokesperson Nabil Abdullah told reporters in Khartoum last night the military did not approve the Rapid Support Forces' recent deployments in Sudan. According to the constitution and law, it is the responsibility of the Sudanese armed forces to maintain the security and safety of the country in cooperation with various state agencies, and the laws have organized this cooperation. Accordingly, we must push the alarm button, because the country is passing a historic and dangerous curve, and the risk increases with the rapid support forces by mobilizing forces and spreading up inside the capital, Khartoum and some cities. Abdullah said the army has tried to find an amicable solution to its dispute with the RSF, but warned the situation risks an outright war. The dispute between the RSF and national forces was exacerbated by talks to create a transitional government to eventually hold elections and put a civilian administration in place. The armed forces kept on in finding peaceful solution to these violations, to keep it peaceful in general, and an unwillingness of an armed conflict that can destroy everything, because all of these foresee incursions, and redeployment is not one of the systems or duties of the rapid support forces and its work. It is in an obvious violation of the law, and it's against the security committee's instructions. Abdullah said the recent deployments could worsen an already volatile political and security situation in Sudan. The military's statement came as the RSF deployed troops in River Nile State on the border with Egypt. Local media reported the force is attempting to build a base in the town of Meroe. The RSF responded by saying its presence in Meroe is in line with its operations and duties in all Sudan's states to maintain security and tranquility. The RSF's statement urged the public and the media not to pay mind to this information it said is meant to fuel the fire of sedition and undermine the country's peace and security. The statement concluded by threatening to sue entities it said propagate false news at the expense of the country's peace and security. The RSF is seen as allied with Sudan's former president, Omar al-Bashir, who was ousted by massive protests in 2019. Many people in the Darfur region know it as a deadly force formerly known as the Janjaweed, accused of committing atrocities during Bashir's three decades in power, especially in the Darfur region. For VOA News, I'm Nabil Biajo in Washington. Some Sudanese in South Sudan's capital, Juba, are expressing concern over the political developments in Sudan, adding that leaders in Sudan should show a patriotic spirit and make compromises in order to prevent any bloodshed in the country. Deng Gai Deng has more for VOA from Juba. Mustafa Jafar, a Sudanese national living in Juba, says he is unhappy with the current situation in his country. 
which he says could result into conflict. Jafir hedges his leaders back home to dialogue and resolve their differences. I don't feel good. I need my people in my country to get peace. I need people to stay in peace in one winter. I need the leaders to make peace. I need the people to be happy in Sudan. You will not benefit. You just kill the people and you come back. And you do nothing for that. Just kill the people. And God will, help, uh, will make something not good for you. Salim Ito, another Sudanese residing in Juba, says the military leaders in the country should show patriotic spirit and make compromises in order to prevent any bloodshed in the country. People, there is no one will go ahead, I think, if they're fighting. And if they're fighting, everything will be so disorganized and everything will be not okay. And you see, uh, especially in uh, Darfur, people are being killed, people are being, people are being displaced. So this is not good at all. This is what I want to say. Yeah. The Rapid Support Forces, or the RSF, is a powerful paramilitary force which emerged from militias involved in the conflict in Darfur which broke out 20 years ago and has been accused of widespread human rights abuses. It joined with the military to overthrow long-ruling strongman Omar Hassan al-Bashir in a coup in 2019. The two forces then carried out another coup in October 2021. Sudanese national Abdel Hassan says the leader of the Rapid Support Forces, General Mohamed Amdan Dagalo, should not choose war but commit to bringing peace and political transformation in Sudan. Hassan says leaders in Sudan should manage the rising tensions in the country in order to prevent conflict. Dagalo is the deputy leader of Sudan's ruling military council. He has recently pulled away from the military and found common ground with a civilian political alliance. Relations between the military and the RSF have worsened, forcing a delay to the signing of an internationally backed agreement with political parties for a two-year civilian-led transition to election. For VOA News, I am Deng Gaideng in Juba. Botswana's wildlife authorities say four rhinoceros were shot and two of them died in a heavily guarded sanctuary, although their horns were not removed. The shootings at the sanctuary in central Botswana came after the government dehorned and relocated most of the rhinos further inland. Mkundi Sedube reports from Habaruni, Botswana. The permanent secretary at the Environment and Tourism Ministry, Tatora Paka, says the shooting took place at the protected Kamarino sanctuary recently. Rapaka says the two carcasses were found with their horns intact while the other animals were recovering from gunshot wounds. The motive of the shooting is unknown. Botswana has been experiencing a poaching crisis since 2018, which has forced authorities to relocate the rhinoceroses from the Okavango Delta, a poaching hotspot. The majority of the rhino population, estimated at 400 in 2019, was moved to other havens to protect them from poachers. Following the recent shooting incident, local rhino conservationist Map Ives fears more rhino attacks could be on the way. I also uh, feel that this will not be the last. These organized criminal syndicates are very determined and they know that uh, there are gaps in our security, particularly financial gaps, so they will be back for more. He says it is not clear why the animals were killed and the horns not removed. He says although the government cannot release too much information on the shooting, there is a need to assure the public about the safety of the rhino sanctuary. I appreciate the government's reluctance to give too much detail. Nonetheless, uh, the Karma Rhino Sanctuary is a public facility into which tourists often travel. And so uh, the presence of armed poachers becomes a security risk for tourism. I would have thought that it is necessary to reassure the public as to the whereabouts of where these animals were shot and the period over which they were shot. More than 200 of Botswana's rhinos have died since 2018 because of poaching or natural causes, the government reported last month. The International Rhino Foundation's executive director, Nina Fasion, says Botswana's recent reports of rhino killings are concerning. The news about more rhinos being poached in Botswana is very distressing. The International Rhino Foundation will continue to work to put a stop to poaching and to put effort into security measures to protect rhinos because the current levels of poaching simply aren't sustainable for these populations. 
Amazonas, neighbors in Namibia and South Africa also have been hard hit by rhino poaching. Namibia lost 87 of the animals to poaching in 2022, the highest recorded in a calendar year in that country. Fasion says there is a need to intensify regional collaboration in the fight against rhino poaching. There is an enormous amount of cooperation and collaboration across borders. Many people working together on this. These are global criminal syndicates behind poaching, and therefore it needs a global coordinated response. The poachers and the product itself, the rhino horn, crosses borders across not only countries but continents. And so it will take law enforcement and others working collaboratively uh, across the globe to get a handle on this. The demand for the horn in China and Vietnam fuels poaching with 548 rhinos killed in 2022 across Africa, according to national government and agency figures. Kondisi Dube for VOA News, Khaboroni, Botswana. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on The Voice of America. I am James Barty in Washington. Today is Friday, April 14. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And still to come on our program, Something for Mali Sports. Villagers in southern Cameroon are complaining about the destruction of farmland by wild elephants in areas bordering Gabon and Equatorial Guinea and are calling on authorities to help. The villagers say elephants have chased people away and made it impossible for farmers on both sides of the border to plant their season's crops. Officials blame farmers for occupying the elephant's habitat, leading to human-wildlife conflict. Moki Edwin Kinzika reports from Yaoundé, Cameroon. Officials of Cameroon's southern border with Gabon and Equatorial Guinea say scores of villagers came out in market squares at Vema and Col Efulan on Thursday, protesting the destruction of several hundred hectares of their farmed land by elephants. The villagers say the stray elephants chase civilians and make it impossible for farmers to plant on both sides of border with Gabon and Equatorial Guinea since the planting season started six weeks ago. Justin Enam Ntem is the traditional ruler of the Nkol Efulan village. He spoke to VOA using a messaging app. Ntem says villagers are angry and hungry because they can no longer go to their farms since the elephants stationed themselves about 500 meters south of the village toward the border with Gabon this week. He says seven of the several hundred hectares of plantain, banana and cassava plantations destroyed by the stray elephants belong to his family. Ntem says it is difficult for villagers who are scared and escaping from their homes and farms to know the number of elephants that are destroying their crops. The villagers say no civilian has died in an elephant attack, but hunger looms if the government does not help by forcing the animals back to their natural habitat. The Cameroonian government says there are more than 220 forest elephants in the nearly 700,000 hectare Campo Man National Park, located near the border area with the other two countries. The New York headquartered Wildlife Conservation Society and the National Parks of Gabon report that Gabon harbors about 95,000 forest elephants. Equatorial Guinea says it has about 900 elephants. The three countries say elephants have been destroying plantations on both sides of their common border within the past six months. Cameroon says at least eight of its border villages and several hundred plantations, especially in Vema and Kol Efulan villages, have reported regular attacks. The elephants are leaving their habitat because of a lack of food and water due to climate change and the occupation of their living environment by civilians, according to Cameroon's Ministry of Forestry and Wildlife. Moki Edwin Kinzaka for VOA News, Yaoundé.
Cameroon. An activist in Ghana is swimming the nearly 500-kilometer-long Volta River, including Lake Volta, to bring attention to water pollution. Yvette Tete, who will swim several hours per day for over a month, is also collecting water samples along the way to test for pollution. Sinanu Tord reports from Lake Volta, Ghana. Ghana's Lake Volta is the world's largest man-made lake by surface area. An activist, Ivetete, is swimming its entire length as part of her swim across the Volta River's almost 500 kilometers. In less than a month, Tete swam 300 kilometers, up to 14 per day, to raise awareness on Ghana's worsening water pollution. There's no action that people take unless they care. And so what we're doing with the swim is just basically bringing people into the experience of what it feels like what it is to be in this absolutely incredible part of Ghana and to show them it is worth it to bring our attention to the space to make sure that we are preserving the beauty. Teta is accompanied by researchers from the All Foundation which is supporting her swim and advocates against textile waste. They are collecting water and air samples along the way to study what is driving water pollution. Ghana imports about 50 million pieces of second-hand clothes each week, but the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change says about 40% of it ends up in landfills and then in water. The number of uh, clothing tentacles at the beachfronts and water bodies has increased over time. Now, microfibers and chemicals from these clothing, these items of clothing that are overrun across the beaches, leach into the water and end up polluting the water for the communities um, that live in and around the water bodies. The United Nations says 76% of Ghanaian households are at the risk of drinking contaminated water. Ecological researcher Josiao Ayesu is leading the All Foundations team. He says the team hopes its research okay. will cause clothing manufacturers to be held accountable for waste products shipped to Ghana, and this will be done through a system known as the Extended Producer Responsibility, or EPR. The main aim of the OR is to um, push EPR policy um, to the global north, that's Europe and America, for the harm being done to us by manufacturing clothes and pushing it down the line for us to face the consequences. And so the data that we get, it's an evidence Tete says by completing the swim, she hopes to inspire others to protect the environment, one stroke at a time. Sana Nutod for VOA News, Lake Volta, Ghana. A week of flooding has displaced thousands of families in the western part of Burundi. The Associated Press that more than 4,000 families living in the village of Gatumba have been displaced, with some spending nights out in the cold. Local authorities say it is the third consecutive time in three years that the Ruzizi River near the border with the Democratic Republic of Congo has overflowed. Humanitarian agencies say Western Burundi faces flooding due to abnormal rainfall in the region near Lake Tanganyika, where 800,000 people live. The Associated Press says flooding has forced nearly 40,000 people to move to camps in Katumba in the last three years. At least 7,000 have relocated out of the village to safer areas. A severe drought in North Africa has left Tunisian farmers brazen for a poor harvest and is putting food security at risk. The French news agency AFP says the lack of rainfall has killed off crops, a situation exacerbated by the depletion of water sources caused by climate change. In response, the government last month imposed emergency measures, including the rationing of household water for washing cars and also for irrigating fields. Some farmers complain that the cost is also high for seeds, fertilizer, pesticides and wages. The Farming and Fishing Union, the UTAP, is predicting that this year's harvest will fall by two-thirds from last year. It is time now for Daybreak Africa Sports, and here is Samson Omande in Abuja, Nigeria. A very good Friday morning to you, Samson. Good Friday morning to you too, James. We begin the sport with news concerning African football of the year. Bayern Munich have suspended Senegalese forward Sadou Mane for one game following an altercation with teammate Leroy Sane. After this week's Champions League loss to Manchester City, the club announced that Sadou Mane will not be in the FC Bayern squad for the home game against 
1899 Coffee Hand next Saturday. Bayern said the reason for Mane's suspension is misconduct after FC Bayern's Champions League game at Manchester City. In Italy, Napoli forward Victor Simon will be fit for the UEFA Champions League quarterfinal second leg at home to AC Milan next week. Napoli manager Luciano Spalletti confirmed these on Thursday after the Nigerian forward missed Wednesday's 1-0 loss in the first leg match. The Nigerian international, who is Serie A's top scorer with 21 goals, was sidelined for this month's league games against AC Milan and Leeds due to a thigh strain. Serie A leader Napoli have never reached the UEFA Champions League semi-finals. Staying with football news, ousted Zimbabwe Football Association President Felton Kamambo facing 32 bribery count had his appeal for a review of the magistrate's decision dismissing his application for discharge thrown out by the High Court. Kamambo had mounted an appeal at the High Court complaining that the magistrate Bianca Mwakwande erred in failing to discharge him at the close of the state's case. In their ruling, judges of the Court of Appeal said they had no reason to interfere with an ongoing trial. In rugby news, Tunisia's under-2015 rugby team will participate in the Bahatsi Trophy organized by the Rugby Africa on April 22nd to the 30th in Nairobi. Seven other teams will partake in this tournament. They are Zimbabwe, Namibia, Madagascar, Kenya, Uganda, Zambia and Cote d'Ivoire. Tunisia will take on Madagascar in the quarterfinals on April 22nd. In motorsports, multiple Zambia and Africa rally champion Muna Singh Sr. has died after months of illness at the age of 53. The two-time Africa rally champion suffered from a liver complication and went to India for a transplant. Unfortunately, Singh was announced dead on Wednesday. Muna Singh won back-to-back Africa Rally Championships in 2004 and 2005. And now to golf. Uganda's junior golf national team that will compete at the 2023 All-Africa Junior Golf Championship at the Lake Victoria Serena Golf Resort and Spa has been named. The team will be skippered by 17-year-old Joseph Regan Akina. Akina is vastly experienced, having also played at the 2022 All-Africa Junior Golf Championship that was held in Egypt alongside Ibrahim Samakula, who is 16 years old. And that's it for this Friday's edition of Daybreak Africa Sports. I am Samson Omale in Abuja, Nigeria. It's back to you, James, in Washington. Thank you, Samson. Have a nice weekend. And that's it for this Friday, April 14th edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for spending your week with us. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are also on YouTube, where you can watch our TV shows, Africa 54, Straight Talk Africa, and Red Carpet. On behalf of the Daybreak Africa crew, I am James Barty in Washington, wishing that you will have a great weekend. We'll see you again on Monday morning. VOA brings you the best in African music on the African beat. African Beat showcases the latest and the greatest of contemporary African music. From bobo music to hip life, bonga flavor to sukus, Afrobeat to Ndombolo and Makosa to Kwaito. The African Beat on VOA has it all. And it's happening right here, Mondays through Fridays at 0905 and 2005 UTC, right after the international news. Hey, sports fans.